Good, good Wednesday morning. Uh, continuing the same chapter as two and no, this chapter three of St. Mark. But it's very similar and it's really, it's an extremely important lesson. I, I'll show you what I think of it. We can imagine the early preaching of the church. Mark is maybe 65 AD. And it's just interesting, the inner struggle they must have had with Jewish Christians, Judeo Christians. Not because they're condemning them, but the struggle within the law and the rules. It's, I used this yesterday, I think. I said the problem in, in our time, uh, not so much immediately, but the last maybe 100 years ago or more, was they called European, and when we were evangelizing Native Americans, called evangelization, uh, um, American, Europe, sorry, I'm sorry, Europeanization, that you had to first be a European before you could be a Christian. It was false, okay, but we imposed that on the Native Americans, and this is the same thing that they were adhering to. You impose Judaism on Romans in order to become Christians. Remember, that's who Mark's writing to, Christian Roman, Jewish Christians in Rome. I think I said that right. But watch what he says here. I started off sloppy here, I'm sorry. Jesus entered the synagogue, and there was a man who had a withered hand. They watched Jesus closely to see if he would cure him on the Sabbath. So they might accuse him. So he said to the man with the withered hand, come up here before us. Then he said to the Pharisees, and this is a great question, is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath rather than to do evil, to save life rather than to destroy it? See, that's how you shape your judgment. See, that's, you're setting a moral standard. But they remained silent, looking around at them with anger. He's mad at them. And he grieved at their hardness of heart. And Jesus said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out and his hand was restored. Now the Pharisees went out and immediately took counsel with the Herodians against him to put him to death for doing a good thing. But what did he do? He defied the law. See, he was on the Sabbath. He broke the rules. He did a good thing by breaking the rules. See that? That's, that's just very, very interesting. Is it, they, they, he said to them, come here, is it, is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath rather than evil? To do good, you see. And I, I have to say for myself personally, I had to overcome an awful lot of that scrupulosity. I would have been a, I would have been a Pharisee. I have no doubt about it. I'd have been, because when I grew up, I was so much law-oriented, rules-oriented scrupulous beyond scruples i wouldn't have i wouldn't have cured him on the sabbath <laughs> and i would have condemned anyone who would have maybe not outwardly but i was a very 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 strict rigorous legalistic rigorous when i was growing up and it was the order that sprung me loose of that i have to say I remember going to oh Lord, I can remember going to confession in the order and it took the guys in the outfit, especially Simon Wood, to start to really reshape my conscience. Oh Lord. It was such trivial matters and that we put such weight on them. Did you talk in church? How much meat did you eat on Friday? Did you eat less than two ounces or more than two ounces? The canon lawyers took up over the moral teaching of the church, and so we looked at everything in a very pharisaical way. There's a kind of a joke in the church that's saying the Pharisees, excuse me, the canon lawyers are the revenge of the Pharisees on the church, and there's some truth in that because of the rigorism that was present there. Keeping rules, and, and the church has, a, as an institution and as a moral guide, needs to have commandments and rules. And, but they have to be exercised and, and lived by love, not out of fear, and not out of sheer conformity, but out of love. Love for the church, love for Christ, love for each other. Right? It doesn't, it actually, it's more demanding. It's easy to say, I fulfilled all my Christian obligations, I go to Mass on Sunday. See? Wow, it's a lot more than that. There are some a lot better Christians out there who who haven't seen a church in, in a year, but they take care of their families. They take care of their good people. They're good and gracious and generous and charitable people. 
one of the best and most uh, really Christian people I have known in my life very often weren't Christians at home. They may not have been believers. See? Christians, to exercise the faith is to exercise it with love, not out of fear, and not out of the rigorism of law. I had to learn that lesson. And I learned it. I learned it in the order. I can remember poor Father Simon Wood. He was my confessor for a couple of years. I think I drove him nuts. I remember one time I did, I went to confession, got out, did something. I forgot what I did. I think I banged my leg against the pew in church, okay? And I said a bad word, okay? I cussed. Well, how can I go to communion now? That has to be a mortal sin, which of course it's not. But I thought it was. Back into confessional. Bless me, Father, for I have sinned. been 15 minutes since my last confession. I'm lucky you didn't throw me out of my ass. You see, it was Spike. It was Simon. Yeah. That was the scruples of the 50s, and I embraced it entirely. Those weren't the good old days. Those were days of religious horror. That wasn't true piety. It was terror. And we used the confessional as a terror we terrified people into the confessional. We had mortal sins that even Jesus never heard of, okay? The Pharisees would have, they played second to, to our Phariseeism. I'm glad that period is over. The Second Vatican Council broke that. And in some ways, we've lost a lot of Christians. Uh, history will tell us why, not in my lifetime. But the point is, Christianity, is, and especially Roman Catholicism, is preached with more authenticity today in our pastoral practice and it, than it ever did before. We're not, we're not out there imposing laws on people. We're trying to preach the gospel, a gospel of love and hope. That's the truth. We're not a security blanket. We're preaching an opportunity to love well. And we see that Christ asks us, commands us to love well who the people in our lives see that's the truth i'm grateful i came before the council during the council and afterwards and the reason is i know the old way i know pharisaism i am it or i was it no more no more i'm free the passionist community and her preaching of the passion of christ her confessing our confessionals and all the rest. We are darn good confessors because we first and foremost look at a crucified Christ who loves us. No wonder people line up to come to, to the monasteries to come to confession. Oh, when I was stationed in Baltimore 20 years ago, what was it, 30 years ago? Oh, Lord. Or no, in Louisville. It was in Louisville. Oh, Lord. <laughs> they would, when I was assigned for that day, they would come, okay? And you never knew when, where, or how, but you just were on call. And you hear your number, your buzzer go off. <laughs> and it's because we're good confessors. We're good confessors. Not just the fact that no one knows us, we don't see them, they don't see us. Just a voice in the dark. But I think we bring the compassion of Christ. If we don't, who does? If you're looking upon the cross of Christ, how can you not? extend his compassionate suffering for the suffering of the world. How can you not? How can you bring judgment in, to a person who's seeking redemption rather than the redeeming love of Christ? See, I mean that. I'm grateful for my passionate vocation. It's freed me from terror, but it also gives me the opportunity to, pat, to preach and to exercise the sacrifice, the sacraments in and through the compassion of Christ. I hope I never forget that. I hope I am never a burden on people's souls. I hope I have, my vocation has called me to free people of their burdens, not to place them on their back. I hope I never put the burdens on somebody's back, but rather help to lift them.